sorry for the delay, it was kind of sick for a week. But here we finally are with the first ever ADG mod video. Now this series is about taking a look at how to modify an ancient DOS game, or we'll sometimes also cover expansions or other first or third party content, source ports, or other relevant things. But for this first video, I'm going to give you all a crash course in modifying Duke Nukem 3D mostly with an emphasis on level design for reasons which will be very obvious by the end of the video. Now, I do want to point out before we get started that I will be using a source port of both Duke Nukem 3D and the build editor for the majority of this video, referred to as eDuke32 and Mapster32 respectively. The fact of the matter is that these source ports are just plain better to use than going with the DOS originals, but much of what I'll be discussing will apply to the DOS originals too, so that's just something to keep in mind as we dive into this. So on screen at the moment, I'm actually showing you all E1L1, the first level of the first episode of Duke Nukem 3D, Hollywood Holocaust, loaded up in Mapster. Now, as most of you already know, the build engine used to make Duke Nukem 3D is commonly referred to as a 2.5D engine, in that it's feigning 3D using a 2D design. In fact, the build engine is very similar to the Doom engine, where you have sectors made out of lines and vertices, each connected in various patterns, with floor heights, ceiling heights, and textures assigned to produce 3D spaces. Unlike Doom, though, which uses binary space partition trees to cull areas which don't need to be drawn, the approach in build is to count the pixels rendered and to just portal through to connected sectors until all pixels have been accounted for. This approach is what allows build engine games to have sectors which can spin and move, something the Doom engine was never capable of having, <laughs> technically. Later Doom engine games had special kinds of objects which could move three-dimensionally, but they were very limited in what they could do. Let's actually make something to demonstrate just how all of this works. Now when you start up an empty map in Mapster, you'll have a grid, a player marker, and not much else. Drawing a sector is very simple. You just press spacebar to plop down a vertex, move the mouse to where you want to place the next vertex for the sector, press spacebar to make another vertex, and just keep this up until you end your drawing on the vertex that you started with. Now you can reposition a vertex simply by clicking and dragging, plus to get things aligned and sized properly, you can use the G key to adjust the grid size. The largest size grid equates perfectly to a 64 by 64 pixel large floor or ceiling texture, which is the resolution most of the floor and ceiling textures in Duke Nukem 3D are. Now the camera is always centered on the player marker. You can move the player forwards and backwards with the arrow keys, as well as turn clockwise and counterclockwise, where you can reposition the player directly by holding the right mouse button down and moving the mouse to get the position where you want it to be. You can also press scroll lock of all keys to set the default starting position of player 1 to the current player marker position, which is necessary for any map intended to be played solo or cooperatively. So you may immediately be wondering why you seemingly have tank controls on a level editor of all things. Well, this is where the ingeniousness of the build engine really shines, in that by pressing the keypad enter key, you switch from 2D editing mode to 3D editing mode. Now, unlike the 2D mode, which is about building the overhead layout of the level, the 3D mode is all about setting up the floor and ceiling heights and texturing everything. So for this sector that we've just made here, if we move the mouse cursor over the ceiling and press page up, we'll move the ceiling up by one step, with there being 16 steps of height for a perfect cube using the largest grid size in the 2D mode, with 16 steps of height also being typical for a doorway and roughly equivalent to 2 meters of height in the real world. In fact, if you're ever confused about just how big everything is in relation to the game's objects, just plop down a sprite of Duke Nukem himself. In both the 2D and 3D mode, pressing the S key will put down a sprite, now you can change the texture of a sprite, or anything for that matter, by highlighting it with the mouse cursor in 3D mode and pressing the V key. The initial list which shows up only represents textures which are actually in use, with numbers indicating how many instances of that texture are assigned. Pressing V a second time will bring up the entire list of textures. I should quickly point out, the textures looking dark sometimes is a bug with my version of Mapster, and it's seemingly random when it occurs. If it happens to you, just hit escape and try hitting V again. Now you can select a texture manually, press G to type in the exact texture ID number, or press S to do a named search, as many textures have names attached to them for scripting purposes. The sprite for indicating a spawn point for Duke is named A Player, so we're just going to search for that, move the cursor over a few because A Player Top shows up first, select the A Player texture, and uh, yeah, that's actually way too big. 
So for as straightforward as level editing is, sizing isn't handled very well. Now, most scripted entities already have predetermined sizes, so no matter how big or small you make them in the editor, they'll be the proper size in the game. But just so we can get Duke to the proper size so we can see how big everything is, we want to put the mouse cursor over the Duke sprite and use the numeric keypad to adjust the texture alignment and sizing. How the numpad behaves differs between sprites, walls, floors, and ceilings, and it's something you're just going to have to adapt to. But for sprites, it simply allows us to adjust the size of the sprite. In the bottom corner, we can see the current sizing is 64 by 64, but we actually want this to be 40 by 40 for a properly sized Duke sprite. I should also point out that you can go by steps of 8 at a time using the mirror keypad by holding the 5 key down in the middle while pressing the other numpad keys. Now that Duke's the right size, we can get a better idea of how big we want to make this room and what we want to do with it. Now let's make it 16 steps bigger, so that's 32 steps tall, and let's make it feel like it's outside. If we change the ceiling texture to the LA texture, you'll notice it looks mm, kind of wrong. To enable a parallax sky surface, we simply point at the floor or ceiling to parallax and hit the P key. Now, this is one thing which is going to differ slightly between this source port and the original Duke Nukem 3D, as the original build engine had three different parallaxing modes to choose from, so if you're using the actual build editor and not Mapster, your sky may still look wrong after enabling parallaxing in which case you can adjust the parallax mode with control P, whereas Mapster is smart about which mode to use and ignores the parallax mode settings. We'll also make some texture changes here, get some grass going, make the outer walls a little more presentable, and then next, we'll make a platform we can take some stairs up onto. And to make the platform requires a couple steps. The first thing we're going to do is draw a new sector in the shape of our platform inside the existing sector. The first thing to note when we complete this shape is that the walls are still white. What we've actually done is made a cutout from the existing sector. Thus, if we go into the 3D mode, we can see there is nothing beyond the lines we just made. To turn a cutout into a sector, simply place the mouse over it in the 2D mode and press Alt-S. As you can see, the walls have turned red. White walls are one-sided, meaning a sector is only present on one side of the wall. Red walls are two-sided, meaning a sector exists on either side, and depending on the height values of the floor and ceiling, different textures may become visible along those walls. If we go into the 3D mode, you won't see the platform at all, because it was given the same floor and ceiling properties as a sector surrounding it. But the selection details in the corner can help us ID when the mouse is over the new sector. Or we can just use the page up or page down keys to alter the floor height to see the outline of what we created. Then we can set the height back. What we want to do is increase the height of our new sector by 16 steps to make a platform and we'll texture it appropriately. This would be a good time to talk about the Z-axis modes in the 3D view. Pressing Caps Lock will cycle through three different Z-axis modes, referred to as Locked Sector, Locked Free, and Gravity. The locked sector mode locks your Z height relative to the floor height of the sector the player marker is in. Now you can use the A and Z keys to alter this height in steps, but it will always remain relative to the current sector's height. Locked free is basically free flight, where you can use the A and Z keys to float up and down, and otherwise your Z position doesn't change on its own. Gravity mode has the player fall and makes it as close to walking around the world as possible. The height you stabilize at in the gravity mode is the same height as when playing the game, so you can use this to gauge how big things are when you're up close to them, or just walk around what you've made. Now let's make some stairs. In the 2D mode, you can add a vertex to any line simply by pressing the insert key where you want the vertex to be. However, to delete a vertex, you have to merge it with an existing vertex by moving it over top of another. This is one aspect of the original build engine which is slightly buggy and might corrupt the map data on a larger map, so it's best to save right before any time you need to delete existing level geometry. From here, we're going to draw some new sectors, but notice that we don't have to start and stop on the same point. The moment we've completely split a sector into two sectors, the editor recognizes this and creates the new sector. We'll do this seven times to get the seven steps that we want. Then we can do this, go into the 3D mode and set them up. And by the way, if you end up making a mistake in creating your new sectors, you can use the backspace key to go back as many steps as needed until you completely cancel out the sector drawing you intended to do if you really have to. Let's do some more advanced texturing tricks now. 
The tab and enter keys on the keyboard are basically your copy and paste keys for textures. Pressing tab will copy whatever texture you're looking at to the clipboard along with its properties, which you can then paste onto any sprite, wall, floor, or ceiling using the enter key. But then how are we going to deal with the sides of these stairs? Well, first let's decide on a texture to use, then we'll copy paste it to each spot. Then we can press the period key to align all matching connected textures in sequence with the specific wall we have highlighted. We can then use the numpad on its own to resize or hold alt when using the numpad to reposition, then just press period again and not only will it realign everything, but reapply the resizing as well. Now if we screw up majorly, we can press the slash key to reset the texture properties to default. Also, I should point out, alignment always travels right with the period key. If you want the alignment to travel left instead, use the comma key. Now let's give our new platform a railing. Let's put down a sprite with the S key and give it a proper railing texture. The only trouble is that it's currently just a static object and we want it to be flat. To do that, use the R key in the 3D mode to switch a sprite between object, flat wall, and flat surface. We can then use comma and period again to affect the rotation of the object. In the 2D mode, we can even see the sprite is now represented as a T-shaped line to indicate the front-facing side and the size of the sprite. Also note the color. By using the B key, we can turn blocking mode on and off for a sprite, with a purplish color indicating blocking enabled and white indicating not. We can also use Ctrl H to turn hit detection on and off, represented with a thick line as opposed to a thin line. So with a railing, we want it to block actors, but we'd like weapon shots to not hit it. So we want it to be thin and purple. We can then drag it into place, click and drag the left mouse button to select it, and then use Control insert to make a copy of our selection. Though keep in mind the copy will be placed directly over top of the original, so it's often a good idea to be dragging the selection around and using Control insert to plop down copies while you're dragging. With our railing in place, let's focus on making a building that we can go into. By inserting some vertices and repositioning existing vertices, we can create the illusion of a building that we can walk into. But there's a problem. It looks pretty small from the outside. How do we make it look bigger? I mean, we could just raise the ceiling height, but that also makes the surrounding walls taller. But this is actually the first step towards how we intend to do this. We, what we want to do next is create a new sector around the outer edge of our main sector. Now note that because we're branching off of a sector into non-sector space, we have to form the entire loop. We can't just start and stop at two different endpoints, because that is how you split an existing sector, not create new ones. Now we can just bring the floor height of this new sector up to where we want it, and drop the ceiling down to match. And as you can see, when two parallaxing surfaces have a wall between them, that wall is not rendered. So all we see is the city beyond. Though if we turn parallaxing off, you'll note the sectors in the middle, where the platform is, still have their ceiling height set low. Now you can adjust all of them at once using the sector selection tool, by holding right alt specifically, and dragging a box around all the sectors you want to adjust at once in the 2D mode, then go back into the 3D mode, and using the height adjusting keys, it'll affect all of them at the same time. Sector selecting like this is also how you duplicate sectors, delete sectors, or move entire sectors without affecting the sectors around them. In fact, this is one of the two best ways to delete a sector. The other is to join two sectors together using the J key. Simply deleting all the vertices for a sector may not properly delete it, so it's best to avoid doing that. Now let's get really advanced. I've put a quick little interior into this building, and the next thing we're going to do is make a horizontally sliding door to go inside. Now these sliding doors are particularly complicated, but also very useful, which is why I want to show how to make them. Now before you start playing around with active level elements, I recommend running through the special underscore SE and underscore ST maps included with Duke Nukem 3D, both in-game and in the editor, because these maps demonstrate, at the most basic level possible, every sector effector and sector tag Duke Nukem 3D recognizes, along with what they do. Every wall, sector, and sprite can have two tags assigned, a low tag and a high tag. But generally speaking, low tags are what are used to set the most basic effect of something, whereas high tags are used to link multiple things with matching high tags together. 
For a two-way sliding door, we need two sectors, one for the left door and another for the right door, both of which will have a sector low tag of 25 to give them the sliding door effect when activated. You can see a list of sector low tag effects in Mapster by pressing F1 for help, followed by 7 for page 7. However, while this would be enough to get a simple up and down door working like in Doom, sliding doors need a lot of extra work. For starters, the way these doors actually function is by moving every single one-sided wall in the sector in a particular direction by a particular distance. So we actually have to build the sector in kind of a peculiar way, which you can see on screen now where we have the one-sided walls representing the doors overlapping the two-sided walls which are splitting the sector off from the entryway. It's also a good idea to bring the door to a point, not only so you can adjust the middle texture, which would otherwise be inaccessible if it were flat, but this also helps to prevent the player from getting squished if they end up between the door when it closes. We also need to tell the doors which way to move. This is done with a sector effector sprite. By placing a sector effector sprite inside a sector, we're telling that sector that we want to add effect data to it. Now by giving the sector effector sprite a low tag of 15, we're telling the sector to slide the one-sided walls in the opposite direction the sprite is pointing towards when we activate it. So if the sprite is pointing left, the door will open to the right and close to the left. Also note though that we have two doors that we want to open simultaneously. So we need a properly aligned sector effector placed in both door sectors, and we need to set their high tags to any matching value we want. In this case, I just set them to 1. Bear in mind, if we later set other things to a high tag of 1, they would all interact with each other, so be mindful of your high tags. Now this created a working door, but you'll note that it not only is it silent, but it also doesn't open all the way, and it's dragging some flooring with it. Now the flooring thing is fixed simply by changing the sector's first wall, which we'll discuss in a bit. As for the lack of sound, you can place a music and SFX sprite into one of the two door sectors to have it play back a sound effect when activated by low tagging it with the sound number that you want to use, as you really only need one sound effect for both doors. And I'll have a link in the video description to a very good website for looking up the sound effect details among other things. As for the door's distance, this needs to be set with a GP speed sprite, which is used to affect how fast an effect is or how far an effect will travel. Now if we want to get really fancy, we can even get into how to make switches, the usage of activator sprites, touch plates, and a host of other effects. But again, it's much easier to look up how this stuff works in the special underscore SE and ST maps. Really, it all just comes down to tags. So just look at how an effect is done in one of your favorite maps by looking at the sector tags, wall tags, sprite tags, as well as what kinds of special sprites are present. And a lot of this is actually really simple to figure out. I wanted to cover sliding doors specifically because they're one of the more complicated effects to get working. And as you can see, it works pretty well now. The last thing I'm going to demonstrate are sloped floors and ceilings, as well as the illusion of sectors over sectors. I've given the room in our building here a huge gap which needs to be crossed. Failing to cross it isn't deadly, because it's not that deep, so you'll have to use a ramp to get back out. A sector can be sloped simply by pressing the square bracket keys in the 3D mode while pointing at the surface that you want to slope, plus you can hold down shift while using the square bracket keys for finer control over the slope height. Now, it's probably not going to slope the way you want it to at first, as the way slopes work is based on the sector's quote, first wall. To set a first wall properly requires careful positioning of the mouse cursor in the 2D mode so that the cursor is inside the sector you want to adjust, and so that the wall that you want to set as the first wall is highlighted. Once this is the case, press Alt-F and you'll set the sector's first wall. As for making a bridge that can be walked under, we can't use sectors. The way the build engine works makes it impossible for a sector line to interact with more than two sectors at a time. So where does that leave us? I mean, it's clearly possible because such a bridge exists on the very first level of the game. Well, if you take a close look at that bridge in the build editor, you can see it's made up entirely of flat sprites. So that's what we need to do here. Though it's important to note when making solid three-dimensional objects out of sprites like this, that you should make the sprites one-sided so that you can't see their reverse side. It's not too important for a hardware accelerated source port, but very important so that these things render properly in the original DOS version. All you do is point at the sprite in the 3D mode and press the 1 key on the top row of numbers to set or clear the one-sided bit on a sprite. 
Next, we're only going to make a single segment of the bridge to start. We can do this with a mere six sprites, making sure to manipulate their size and orientation every step of the way. We also need to use the F key in the 3D mode to flip the bottom sprite so that it faces downwards instead of upwards. We can then highlight the entire set of sprites and copy paste them to make our completed bridge. Well, almost. Turns out because texture stretching is limited to 255 units and we're using a small texture for our siding which needed to be stretched to 256, there's little slivers of space between them. So we'll just change that and copy paste the result to the other segments. There we go. Now our bridge is complete. As you're map making though, remember to pay attention to the engine limits. Anytime the cursor is not inside a sector, you'll see the sector wall and sprite limits and how much of them you're using. My experience has been that you typically won't reach these limits unless you're either getting super detailed with the shapes of your sectors, such as making lots of curved walls and making them very smooth, or unless you make the map really freaking big and fill most of the available physical space. So these limits are actually pretty generous, just be aware that they're there. Now, I've only scratched the surface of what's possible here. You can make translucent walls and sprites, adjust shading levels, change the palettes of objects, set up dynamic lighting effects, mirrors, spawners, teleports, elevators, spinning things, explosion sequences, key locks, puzzle locks, night vision specific lettering, and heck, if you want to completely break compatibility with the DOS version of Duke Nukem 3D, you can even get into a special feature known as True Room Over Room, which allows for stacking sectors on top of each each other to produce real sector over sector effects. Well, mind you, they can be a bit glitchy at the moment and they're extremely challenging to set up. So you're kind of better off forgetting they exist until you really get freaking good at making maps. The point is though, there's a lot more to learn when it comes to map making or just editing the game in general. So I recommend getting started with the content creation section over on the eduke32 wiki over at wiki.eduke32.com, which is pretty extensive in and of itself, along with links to useful resources, including reference material over at the Duke Nukem 3D informational suite, over at infosuite.duke4.net. Mapster itself is also has plenty of built-in help details, which you can pull up with the F1 and number keys, and you can scroll the longer pages which pop up with the arrow keys. However, there's more to making custom content for Duke Nukem 3D than just map making. You may also want to put together your own episode packs or even add your own art and sound assets into the game. This is quite a bit more complicated and if you intend to do any of this, you may want to make sure you have a backup made of your duke3d.grp file. GRP group files are basically the build engine equivalent to a Doom WAD file. Though unlike Doom WADs which come in two flavors, one which acts as a base and another which acts as an extension to modify or mutate the base, group files act only as a base. So to extend off of them with custom content requires said content to be placed in the same folder that you're running Duke Nukem 3D from, as the build engine prioritizes loading an actual file over a file stored in the group file being used. And the files you'll primarily be modifying to add custom content beyond new maps are the con files and art files, which you can easily extract with either k-extract, the DOS group file extraction tool originally included with Duke Nukem 3D, or using a third-party group file editor, of which there are several to choose from. The con files are basically scripts which tell Duke Nukem 3D how everything in the game works. Now, a lot of Duke 3D is hard-coded, but you'd be surprised just how much of it isn't, and can be manipulated through altering the con file scripts. And there's three con files by default, defs.con, game.con, and user.con. Defs.con is basically a massive list of named equivalents to ID values, so that the other con files can use those names in place of numerical values for easier reading. This is also where you'd find sound effect numbers prior to the more convenient listing over on the InfoSuite site. Game.con is where all the object scripts are, telling the game how every object works and how they function. This is the file you'll modify if you're planning on adding new enemies or new functionality, within the limits of what the scripting language permits. Lastly is user.con, which mostly contains base values for everything, such as player variables, damage values, various text strings that can show up, but most importantly, the level file listing in part times, the sound effect file references and playback values, and the MIDI file list. If you're planning to add your own MIDI music, you absolutely need to edit user.con. 
For modifying existing sound effects, you only need to edit user.con, but to add new sound effects, you'll also need to edit defs.con. And to replace the levels with your own map files, you again only need to edit user.con. I should also point out, you don't need to alter the con files to load a single user-made map on the fly, only if you intend to change the default behavior of how the game works to essentially create your own episode for the game. For dealing with artwork and textures though, you have a couple options. Your first option is to use eduke32 specific def files, which are similar to con files but are used primarily to replace the original assets with high quality variants, though you can also use def files to define new assets. Doing just this, however, will break compatibility with the original DOS version of the game. So if you want to maintain compatibility, you can still make a def file if you want to, but you're also going to need to add your own art into a .art file. Duke Nukem 3D originally came with a program called EditArt, which was an extremely basic graphics editor which you wouldn't want to be caught dead using for legit asset creation. So its primary purpose was more so importing and formatting, as well as defining animations. When you move through the list of textures, the texture ID number 3584 was specifically made to indicate the start of where players could insert their own art assets, as it also corresponds to the beginning of tile014.art as all art files prior contain game graphics to some extent, and the reason it's number 14 is because each art file in sequence contains 256 texture references. 3584 divided by 256 is 14. Now, users are able to add up to 512 of their own custom art assets, or can replace existing art assets by simply placing textures into slots already used by the game, because again, the game loads data from the existing files first before it will load data from the group file while slots 4096 and above are used for the Atomic Edition assets. The reason I'm not going into extensive detail about editing things beyond the levels themselves is because the vast majority of you are never going to. Once you get that deep into modifying the game, you're going to need to learn every little nuance to make it work out even remotely well, and it would take hours to go over all of it. Whereas if all you want to do is make a custom map, well, it's super easy to do and doesn't require making any further modifications to play it. Just know that the tools are there to do a total conversion if you're so inclined. But map making is probably what most of you will do. Anyway. And that's all for the first ever ADG mod video. Hopefully you all found an interesting look into how Duke 3D works, and how simple the level design really is, even if modifying the rest of the game isn't quite as straightforward. Now if you all want me to, I can cover even more level design topics regarding Duke 3D in the future, but feel free to make requests on what other games you'd like to learn how to modify, or don't forget that these mod videos will also be used to explore official and unofficial custom content for these old DOS games, including expansion packs and ports. So feel free to make requests regarding those as well, and as usual, make sure to email your requests to adg at pixelships.com, as it's kind of impossible to track the request properly from tweets or YouTube comments. Anyways, next Saturday will be episode 252 of ADG, and we're going to be taking a look at what was arguably the first ever Tycoon game. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small set of you guys.